Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first ever virtual State of the County Address. I'm Laura Baldwin, Chairman of the Board of the Lenexa Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to all our viewers today, our elected officials, chamber members, our civic and business partners, and everyone who lives and works in Johnson County. Thank you for joining us. Obviously, the COVID-19 situation prevents us from getting together in person, but we weren't going to miss the opportunity to gather virtually. With all of the challenges we faced over the last year, there is still much to celebrate. As is the tradition, the State of the County Address is sponsored by the Johnson County Chambers Public Policy Council. The Public Policy Council includes representatives from each Chamber of Commerce in Johnson County, as well as representation from the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. The Council's mission is to monitor legislative activities at the local, state, and national levels and to advocate for legislation that is favorable to our region, our local community, our businesses, and our residents. We strive to foster strong partnerships with our legislators and to educate local businesses about legislative issues. If you are interested in following along on social media, today's event is being live tweeted at hashtag JoCoSOTC. At this time, it is my privilege to introduce Ed Eilert, our chairman of the Johnson County Board of County Commissioners, who will deliver the 2021 State of the County Address. Ed has been a public servant in Johnson County for 42 years. He served 28 years at Overland Park City Hall with 24 years as mayor. Ed was elected to the Board of County Commissioners in 2007 as fourth district commissioner and became chairman four years later. Chairman Eiler is now in the third year of his third term. Ed has called Johnson County his home for more than half a century and has always lived in Overland Park. He started his career as a high school business teacher and retired after 40 years employed as an investment advisor. His business background has helped to guide his public service and local government. Chairman Eilert has long been a strong supporter of the local business community in providing support services to foster economic development and maintain our excellent quality of life. He served as the first chairman at the Johnson County Education Research Triangle Authority, completing two four-year terms. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm virtual welcome to the chairman of the Johnson County Commission, Ed Eilert. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Johnson County's first ever virtual state of the county presentation. And thank you, Ms. Baldwin, for that uh, introduction. I want to thank the Lenexa Chamber of Commerce for their hosting of the 2021 State of the County Address and the Johnson County Chamber's Public Policy Council for their continued sponsorship and support. I also want to say thanks to the leadership and members of our various chamber organizations for the good work you do every day in supporting the Johnson County business community. I want to say up front a special thank you to our county staff, our public information office for their assistance in putting together today's program. And thank you to Allison for her interpretive services with us today. I would also like to acknowledge my fellow county commissioners who are virtually present for the State of the County Address. Uh, Janae Hanslick, uh, Janae is Vice Chair representing the 4th District, Becky Fast, 1st District, Jeff Myers, 2nd District, Charlotte O'Hara, 3rd District, Michael Ashcraft, 5th District, and Shirley Allenbrand, 6th District. Myers, O'Hara, and Allenbrand are participating in their first State of the County presentation as county commissioners since their election last fall. 
I would also like to acknowledge uh, Sheriff Calvin Hayden, District Attorney Steve Howe, and the District 10 Administrative Judge Kelly Ryan, who are able to be with us today. I also want to acknowledge County Manager Penny Post Oak Ferguson, whose presence today in our virtual event. And I also want to publicly recognize with a special thank you to Connie Schmidt. Connie managed and was leading the 2020 elections as our interim election commissioner this last year. She did an outstanding job with challenges presented by the pandemic, managing the uh, large turnout and providing election results in a timely fashion. Connie, thank you very, very much. And I welcome aboard Fred Sherman as our election commissioner. Fred, there are large shoes to fill, but please understand our organization is available to assist you in the future. The annual State of the County Address traditionally has provided an opportunity for county government to reflect on past achievements and challenges as we look forward to a new year and beyond. This past year, however, was far from normal. Without a doubt, we will remember 2020 for a long, long time and the many, many challenges raised from the COVID-19 pandemic. 2020 was a year of face masks, social distancing, testing supplies, and personal protective equipment. It was a year that tested us and at times divided us. It was a year that had economic pain and personal heartaches. Since the first case in Johnson County of COVID-19 was reported, a year and 23 days ago. Many of our residents have experienced a job and possible housing loss and have faced food insecurity for the first time. We will never forget the heavy toll this deadly virus has taken on our community, across our state, and throughout our nation from a threat that was virtually unknown as 2020 began. Please join me in a moment of silence in honoring those we have lost, and we pray for comfort and peace to the families and friends that are left behind. Thank you very much. We are still battling the pandemic, but the tide is turning because of the enduring strength and partnerships. The state of Johnson County is a resilient community. Our battle plans against the pandemic involved many forms in 2020. Our response and recovery efforts have included our local, Public Health Office, Board of Public Health, issuing several life-saving orders and declarations. We activated an emergency operations center to manage the emergency, set up testing clinics, increased our disease investigation resources, and did so much, much more. We established the COVID-19 dashboard to track and share necessary data with our community regarding new cases, test positivity rates, hospitalizations, deaths, and other demographic information. We also stayed connected and kept residents informed through virtual meetings and events, including town hall meetings, press conferences, and weekly Board of County Commission sessions. These adjustments kept our residents up to date on critical information. In our first video, we take a look at the county's response to the pandemic.
At the beginning, we just had this one case, and the hope was, because that person had come back from traveling at another place, that maybe it wouldn't come here. Of course, pretty quickly, we started to see another not related to that person, and then another and another and another, and we knew we were going to be in for uh, some more. You know, this disease is very different than uh, most of the other ones we've dealt with. No, not everybody has symptoms, so there could be infected people walking around who could be spreading it. So we began testing for asymptomatic spread early on. One of the first things that we did was work with our Board of County Commissioners and got some money approved. And so around the region, we were able to quickly um, expand our capabilities to test. So the idea behind case investigation and contact tracing is to break those transmission chains. And we know that we have not been able to be successful in breaking every transmission chain, but um, you know, I tell our staff and I firmly believe that each transmission chain that we can break, each one of those contacts we can identify and get to stay home and do the, their quarantine and the proper public health mitigation, those are lives saved. In the Emergency Operations Center, one of the first things that we were focused on was the uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. And so uh, we worked with our partners and our procurement team to come up with a plan uh, to be able to secure enough PPE uh, so that uh, they didn't go without. It's because the virus loves the indoor environment. It loves when people interact together. And uh, in this environment, the long-term care facilities, it doesn't take much. And so one of the things that we did was begin meeting weekly with uh, operators of these facilities and pushing out information to them on how to improve their infection control processes. We also had outbreaks in other facilities, in restaurants. In some cases, we took testing to those facilities. We worked with their HR on who needs to be isolated and who needs to be in quarantine. We want to make sure that everybody that needed to isolate and quarantine had a safe place to do that. Uh, we worked to find uh, safe lodging situations for individuals that didn't have another safe place to do so. Over the summer we collaborated with the school districts um, and other jurisdictions as much as possible to, to figure out, you know, how do you open school in a pandemic? Is it safe? Is this something we can do? Uh, we really had to sort of problem solve through a lot of that. I think we were able, because of the actions we took early on, to knock things back so that even when we saw the big numbers happen in October and, and uh, November and December, we never got to the point here where we were totally, completely overwhelmed. We were close. We, had, we were getting to that point where there were no real ICU beds available at one point in Kansas City. And uh, you look at hospital capacity, the number of hospitalization has dropped very dr uh, dramatically. Our residents who uh, bought into what uh, the message is understood that we have to do this collectively, understood that um, we have to wear masks, we have to physically distance. So again, it's working and the more that we get to vaccinate people, the more that we get into temperatures that are friendlier, that's going to encourage more outdoor activity, the better it's going to be. While all of our county departments rose to the task in the pandemic, I especially want to say thank you to all the workers of the Johnson County Department of Health and Environment. Their services and responses to the ever-changing, incredibly challenging pandemic have spearheaded our efforts at serving and protecting our residents of all ages. They were not alone in the COVID actions that our community came together to meet the challenge requiring a community response. Our ability to slow the spread of the pandemic would not be possible without our doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, our first responders, essential workers, our teachers, our state and local government workers, our business community, and especially our residents. All are important part partners in a resilient community. Many residents and families heeded warnings, diligently practicing physical distancing. They wore face masks, not only to protect themselves, but those all around them. Because of these common efforts, lives were being saved. 
Face masks were made by county employees and residents alike and donated to MEDACT before personal protective equipment supplies were widely available. More than 30,000 in donations were received in a virtual food and hygiene drive. Home delivered meals were still being delivered to homebound residents, serving an average of 602 meals each month and delivering almost 187,000 meals last year. Our older adult population is the fastest growing demographic. To reflect the county's commitment to our older residents, the Human Services Department was reorganized to place a higher emphasis on the aging services provided. The name was changed to Aging and Human Services in order to assist residents seeking information about aging issues and to be able to find information easier. We approved an additional $250,000 in the 2021 budget to establish a county funded program to serve more elderly residents with in-home supports and services. Aging care services will enable them to continue living in their own homes and divert or delay nursing home placement. We also took quick action and initiated rapid changes at minimizing the impact of the pandemic to keep county government functioning and to make essential public services available. Our next video explains some of those challenges. In March of 2020, the new virus was rapidly evolving and in its early stages of spread in Johnson County. That's when these health, education, and government leaders appeared at this press conference. Less than a week later, a stay-at-home order went into effect, and Johnson County government faced crucial decisions about how to keep services going for people who relied on them. We looked at how we could provide our services safely, but still continuing to provide them even if differently. Our staff came up with creative and innovative ways to continue our programs and services just differently. The county's Department of Aging and Human Services had to find new ways to meet critical needs. There was never a question uh, about if we were going to be able to do the work. Uh, it was just more a matter of how we were going to be able to adjust ourselves to get it done. Her employees wasted no time making quick adjustments. Assessments for things like nursing home placement went virtual. Food pantries stayed open, but to keep everyone safe, they switched to a drive-up method. The pandemic also forced the county to stop using volunteers, so employees distributed home-delivered meals. Other employees innovated. One initiated a virtual food drive. At the mental health center, staff was reorganized to handle more calls coming into the crisis line. I think we also felt a need to be able to serve those individuals that were our frontline essential workers. And so making sure that we were able to provide services to uh, law enforcement, to first responders, to school teachers. For existing clients, some appointments went virtual. But mental health offices remained open with safeguards in place for those clients who needed to be seen in person. Mental health staff also reached out to the community. We did things like uh, send out little cards of encouragement um, across the, the county. Staying home was encouraged a lot in 2020, and that played a big role in the planning for the 2020 elections. Early in the pandemic, officials at the Johnson County Election Office wondered if polling sites were even going to be allowed. Mail-in voting had been part of Kansas elections since 1996. In uh, mid-spring of 2020, uh, we made the decision to send out applications to every registered voter in Johnson County. And it included an application for both the, the uh, August primary election as well as the uh, November general election. And we received them back by the tens of thousands. Election office staff worked long hours verifying signatures and checking IDs. In addition to just under 165,000 mail-in ballots, voting in November took place at 180 in-person sites. 
Perseverance and dedication are in no short supply at the Johnson County Library. When library branches closed in March, many of the staff took up sewing masks and creating face shields, putting 3D printers in the makerspace to good use. They also shifted popular programs like Storytime, the Writers Conference, and career workshops to virtual formats. The library expanded its ebook and magazine offerings and started offering streaming videos. We were hearing from the public that they really missed physical books. And so it seemed that the safest way to do that was through drive throughs um, And we have three drive through locations at, at this moment. All across county government, employees did whatever it took to keep services going during the most challenging of times. Our employees are purpose-driven and they really want to make a difference. Making a difference while meeting the community's needs. We also provided uh, relief to organizations, businesses, and schools in Johnson County that have been negatively impacted by the pandemic. Johnson County was tasked with planning and implementing a strategy to distribute millions of dollars in federal CARES Act funding to reimburse local taxing jurisdictions for COVID-19 expenses and invest in the community. Funding went directly to our health department to support critical efforts to combat the virus. Funds were distributed to our cities and our community partners. The fund designated allocations for small business assistance, workforce development, and acquisition of more than 52 million personal protective equipment items that were then distributed throughout the county. CARES Act funding provided housing support of households at risk of eviction or mortgage default, along with utility assistance. Funds also were allocated to food pantries, long-term care facilities, higher education facilities, and school districts, including parochial schools. We provided utility and food pantry assistance last year to more than 1,700 households through our multi-service centers. We helped 18% more households with rent assistance last year. A few weeks following the arrival of the pandemic in Johnson County, our organization began to measure how the pandemic would affect our financial outlook. We acted swiftly and strategically to make the necessary changes to the 2020 budget and planned for the impact for the 2021 budget as well. We explain in the next video. When the pandemic hit Johnson County in March of last year, plans for the budget for 2021 were already underway. It was right before the shutdown, and so we presented a normal set of numbers and issues, and then within a week or two, the economy was shut down. We looked at the revenues, we re-estimated them, and so we immediately reduced our revenues, or our revenue projections by 25 million. And we were able to have a reduction plan that addressed that. That included a hiring freeze, furloughs, holding capital projects, and really minimizing spending. We were able to achieve minimizing some of the furloughs by reassignments. Um, and then we asked departments for what savings could, could they maintain and, um, and, and what could they put off for a year or two or, or just not, or not do. Now as time went on, we realized that with um, the sales and use tax, it wasn't quite as bad as we thought it was going to be. Sales was still down, but use tax um, was actually very high. Obviously, people ordering online. Over time, parts of the economy opened back up. And the other thing we found with the federal money helping the folks that were unemployed, there was still enough money in the economy that things picked up. So instead of a $25 million deficit, we were looking more at $14 million. And so we continued to keep those um, budget reductions in place though, so it would put us in a better position at the end of the year. We were also able to achieve a quarter mill rollback in property taxes. We were hopeful, I'd say by May or June, 
feeling better by summer. And then as we rolled into fall, it looked like, yeah, it's, it's going to turn out uh, better than we thought. Our department's agencies and offices really came together to find ways to get through this period of time. In Johnson County, what we realize is that when we are in a crisis situation or in a budget crisis, everyone does pull together. They, you know, we have people saying, I can give this up so that somebody else can have it. During the pandemic, the rating agencies, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch, all affirmed the county's top triple, triple A ratings for bonds issued in 2020. Johnson County, was one of only 42 counties out of 3,141 to achieve the top bond rating from all rating agencies. It shows we are fiscally resilient with sound fiscal management and stewardship during unprecedented times. This high rating has saved taxpayers millions of dollars in interest payments for more than a decade. Also last year, the county saved approximately $13 million as a result of refunding current outstanding maturities for future interest savings. While the county has financially fared better than anticipated, due in part to our cost-saving measures and reserves in the county budget, the profound disruption of COVID-19 has caused the state and local economies to stagger. According to the County Economic Research Institute, Siri, employment really took a hit in the second quarter and has not yet fully recovered. In April, Kansas had almost 155,000 jobs lost. That included 42,500 in Johnson County. Lost jobs in April caused the unemployment rate to soar into double-digit percentages in both our state and our county. Since those peaks, joblessness has been reduced by about two-thirds at the end of 2020. One portion of the local economy that remained strong during 2020 was housing. With historically low interest rates, housing demand in Johnson County remained quite strong, resulting in a record of almost 12,000 homes sold during the year. This strong demand helped with uh, historically low interest rates and short supply of homes for sale caused sale prices to increase by almost 10%. Local developers and builders filed 1,800 single-family permits and 1,000 permits for multifamily to meet the continued housing demand. Despite the challenges we faced last year, some great things also happened in 2020. We continued to invest in the county capital infrastructure, public safety, and recreational assets as explained in our next video. If you drive by this facility, you're gonna see that it's a beautiful building. It's one that we can be proud of here in Johnson County. And the nice thing about it too is, it's gonna be able to serve this county for 50, 60, 70 years. This building was constructed with a secure parking garage below the entire courthouse. The other way that we can move inmates to and from the courthouse is a tunnel. We are now going to have a tunnel that goes from the detention center over to the courthouse into the secure basement facility. This building has um, a ton of meeting space, uh, some of it large conference rooms that Larger groups can meet in and discuss matters, but it also gives the attorneys the opportunity throughout this building time to meet in private with their clients. The existing courthouse, based on its age, was not ADA compliant. In the vast majority of courtrooms, you couldn't get a person with disabilities in the, in the courtroom or put them on the witness stand. So when we made that decision, uh, we really took that all the way through with 
drop-off spots, close parking, uh, there's entry ramps. Once you get into the building, it's wide enough so that you can get through the screening area without any difficulty. Automatic doors, every courtroom, every public space is fully ADA accessible. The design and the equipment and technology that have been incorporated into these courtrooms is very much state of the art. The new Johnson County Courthouse is energy efficient in ways the old building couldn't be just because of its age. This is a very high performing building um, associated with managing uh, water, energy savings for electrical power. We have public art as you enter into the building. As you walk in, you look up and there's this beautiful piece of art that's uh, designed by Benjamin Ball. His inspiration was Thomas Hart Benton. So one of the key focus points in the lobby is the existing Goddess of Justice statue. It actually dates back to the late 19th century, originally put on the two courthouses prior in 1890. Bottom line, we need to thank the taxpayers for their willingness to support uh, the quarter cent sales tax, which is financing the courthouse. I hope and I know that uh, this, this facility, this building, will become an icon for the community and uh, uh, emphasizes the interest in this community in providing the appropriate facilities so that our justice system can perform at its highest level. In 2020, we moved into the building in May and, and started doing autopsies in the facility in middle of August. We have the CT scanner um, standing next to our Lodox X-ray, which is a full body X-ray. Um, because of those state of the art pieces of equipment, we've been able to, um, for some individuals, bring them in, uh, run them through the CT scanner, basically looking for one particular issue, for example, a head bleed from a fall, and release them that very same day to the funeral home. If somebody passes away and family tells us, well, they've had these symptoms and they might have had this contact, we have been testing individuals for COVID. We've been able to uh, recognize uh, trends in deaths due to certain types of drugs. The other thing is that we're in the process of building our in-house toxicology lab. We've acquired some machines and are working on building our in-house capabilities. We also have um, smoothed over the process of death investigation, not only for families, but also for law enforcement, emergency medical services, um, the district attorney's office. This past year, we actually, um, in 2020, had a number of accomplishments. The majority of the structural concrete was complete. We also had a large electrical stub station that we worked with uh, Evergy to construct. Uh, we also got the, um, the admin building. We went through final tests on that. The majority of the masonry work was done on the project. And then we also started on the paving. And, and then a lot of equipment, uh, installation, pumps, blowers, piping, all of that. 2021, you know, that's going to be a really big year for Tomahawk Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility. Um, you know, we're going to see a lot of the buildings and structures come online. Uh, McCarthy's going through a lot of startup of the facility right now, uh, bringing equipment online, bringing systems online. Later this year, the overall goal is to start treating flow uh, brought into the site. The Tomahawk facility provides the lowest long-term uh, solution from, for our ratepayers from a cost perspective as well as for the environment. So the, the water we'll be treating here will be treated to a high quality and will provide benefits to the environment here in the near term or the near field just downstream of the treatment plant as well as far field all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Hi everyone, Jeff Stewart, Johnson County Park and Recreation District. There is no question that 2020 was likely the most challenging and disruptive time in JCPRD's 65 year history. That said, I believe that it may have been one of our most successful. In addition to providing access to JCPRD services during this unprecedented time, JCPRD was very successful in making great progress on many planned projects. To highlight a few, 
the Arthur and Betty Verhaeg Park was developed and opened, providing a beautiful park setting and access point to the popular Coffee Creek Streamway Trail. The fully accessible Russell and Helen Means Observation Tower that overlooks the beautiful landscape of Kill Creek Park opened in the fall. In honor of JCPRD's first park superintendent, the John Barclay Plaza was developed and serves as an impressive welcome to Shawnee Mission Park. Initial improvements at Mid-America and Mid-America West sports complexes were also completed just prior to the summer baseball and softball seasons. In 2021, we will celebrate the opening of JCPRD's newest park. Cedar Niles Park is just over a thousand acres of some of the most beautiful property in Johnson County, where you can enjoy over four miles of paved trails that feed you through the entire park. JCPRD continues to enhance existing parks and facilities too. In 2021, you will see a number of old picnic shelters being replaced in Shawnee Mission Park. Trail extensions will be completed in Heritage Park, providing better access to the southeast portion of the park. And Ernie Miller Park will see improved accessibility and a new outdoor amphitheater to be used for the many popular programs that take place throughout the year. I am also so pleased to announce that JCPRD will be launching a public art program. Soon public art will be introduced into park spaces and facilities to enhance and enrich the experience for visitors. These are just a few of the exciting things that are going on at JCPRD. I hope that you all have a great day and that part of it is spent in a JCPRD park or facility. There's other good news to report as well. In 2020, our Board of Commissioners and the Johnson County Airport Commission took actions that will pave the way for economic development to take off near the New Century Air Center. A public-private partnership with Van Trust to bring new business to this area is expected to create thousands of new jobs over the next 10 years. Additionally, in 2020, Johnson County's airports, New Century Air Center near Gardner, and Executive Airport in Olathe had more than 102,000 combined flights, which made our county's airport system the busiest in the state, beating the second place airport by more than 20%. In 2020, our public works, planning, wastewater departments continued to work together on the infrastructure needed to support our growing population and our business community. We also started a process to examine our transit program to use transit dollars efficiently as possible while providing an appropriate level of service that benefits our community. Serving our residents with spatial needs continued to be a priority in 2020. We spent the year finding innovative ways to support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities during the pandemic. There were also increased demands to help our at-risk residents in 2020. Johnson County Mental Health received more calls for assistance during the pandemic and modified and expanded services to respond to those community needs. This included adding staff to answer the 24-7 crisis line providing phone and curbside options for medication refills and virtually serving psychosocial groups. In 2020, the Johnson County Mental Health Co-Responders Program received approval for another co-responder with the Overland Park Police Department. The program also partner, part, partnered with Olathe Police Department to start a new behavioral health unit, the Advanced Crisis Intervention Team, or ACT, to provide a quicker response to behavioral health calls. Co-responders are now embedded within 11 police departments, plus the Sheriff's Office, providing coverage in most cities in Johnson County, plus the unincorporated areas. Also in 2020, the first ever National Co-Responder Conference was organized and held in Johnson County. The conference was attended by 200 law enforcement, fire, medical, 
and mental health professionals representing 20 different states. The second conference is planned for later this year and is expected to be even larger. Public safety remains our top priority. We thank our Sheriff's Office for the role it plays in protecting our community. And for our residents to feel protected, they also must know that there is a support system in place when they need help in a medical emergency. Last year, MEDAC responded to just over 50,000 calls for service and transported about 28,500 patients. 6% of patient transports were attributed to COVID-19. Also in 2020, MEDAC assumed responsibility for ambulance service in the Johnson County Fire District Number 2 area. 2020 was a strong year of community engagement. We broke records with our presidential election in the number of registered voters and turnout. Thank you to those who participated in this very important process. And I want to offer an additional thank you to the 2,355 poll workers who made our successful election year possible. You also answered the call to participate in the 2020 census. Johnson County had the best self-reporting rate in Kansas with almost 80% completing the census and surpassing the state and national rates. Accurate census count is important to our county since it provides critical data points for federal funding and determining where our congressional district's uh, boundaries are located. We remembered our county veterans with our first ever virtual Veterans Day observance. In November, we honored 68 World War II veterans between the age of 92 and 106 and a local Holocaust survivor. The recognition was in celebration of the 75th anniversary of both the ending of the war in Europe and the Holocaust. Earlier this month, a new charter commission began its every 10 year review of county government as required by the county's home rule charter. The commission studies and makes recommendations about the structure and operations of county government. A final report of its findings and recommendations must be submitted by February 4, 2022. And any proposed amendments to the charter must be approved by Johnson County voters. Typically at this event, we present hard copies of our 2020 annual report, uh, archiving the many challenges, changes, and actions by county government in the previous year. This year, it will be available and is accessible online. The pandemic is far from over. As we wrapped up 2020 and headed into 2021, vaccinations became available to us and we have been working for several months to get them into arms as quickly as we receive them. As we enter the final phases of the state's reopening plan, we know what works. Wearing masks, social distancing, and vaccinations in protecting ourselves and the safety of others around us. While optimistic that uh, each vaccine brings us closer to the COVID-19 finish line, we know that, uh, however, tough decisions are probably still ahead and challenges remain. In looking ahead, we will continue to focus at keeping Johnson County a great place to work, live, raise a family, and retire. Throughout the past 13 months, we have tackled many challenges. And while we're not out of the woods just yet, we know that if we work together, 
we move forward together to embrace opportunity and to fortify our future. Thank you for attending this event today. We are resilient. We will move forward. Stay well, be safe, and best wishes for 2021. Thank you.